survey the demographics. What demographics would you take into place? That they're all, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that they're looking at, right? Which is why Norman can be celebrating right now. It's one more thing they can put on their resume when they're trying to recruit, re, uh, recruit other communities. But what else on the demographics? Education level. Why is education level so important? Because it depends on what your business is and the education level there. If you're putting in a computer software company, and you have a ton of high school dropouts, that ain't going to work. Very good. Very good. So you would look at your educational systems, your secondary primarily as well, and you would make sure that uh, you had a workforce that you could cultivate there, correct? Yeah. Very good. What else comes to mind? Yeah, like along with the education, like knowing qualified workers can want qualified, and like how many are unemployed. So you would take the unemployment rate into, into consideration there. If you had a high unemployment rate and you had a low educational attainment well, you rate. Figure, like, why they're unemployed and <coughs> you wouldn't want to move your business somewhere where you can't find people to work. Correct. Very good. Very good. What else would you look at? Would you like financial taxes? Mm -hmm. So you can see why some of these measurable things that were on this report that just came out from the real estate, why some of those things were on there. They looked at tax, they looked at you know, the amenities that you had in your community. What else? Did we say property value? Property value, which is one that Bob brought up and why uh, people started looking at Edmond and going out. When you're a business going into it, you do look at all of the above. You have to look at your workforce will be living in that community as well. And so you have to look at early childhood. You have to look at the educational system. How are they functioning? How are they rating? Because the bottom line is, if I have an engineer that's living in Nebraska right now and I'm relocating my company to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, I'd be better be able to show them the amenities of being able to move there. Let me tell you, this is a great quality of life. We're improving your situation. This is what we're going to be doing. And I'm going to have to entice that because I could lose my workforce in that transition as well. And so we have to look at it. And their employees have to live here. So not only do we cultivate it, but we have some that we would end up relocating here as well, too. And so those are things that we have to look at in the big picture of things. This is a very interesting thing. I love it, and I love that Bartlesville's number nine. I, and I think we're number one. So when you're going back to Norman, I'm telling you, I, I, that's my university. <laughs> I, I love Norman. I really do. But there's no place like home for me, and that's Bartlesville, and that's where I planted my roots, because we have some things here that I think, unlike any other place in the U.S., is unique to this community. And so every community has the ability to, to really get excited about their community, but we have to work at that. It's not something that just happens. But we also have to have a really realistic picture of things as well. So when they talked about the 4.2 unemployment rate, what do you think about that? Have you ever heard of the Pew Report? I was hoping to have a copy of that here for you all, but our printer is down and your email was down. So um, I want you all to write this down and I want you to Google it. The Pew Report, and you're particularly looking for economic and effort mobility that was sent out in 2013. P-E-W. P-E-W, all caps. And you want to look for? Economic and effort mobility. It was a report that was submitted and came out in 2013. Guess where the state of Oklahoma is? So most of you in this room are from the state of Oklahoma, with the exception of some from California, South Dakota. But most of you are in the state of Oklahoma, guess where we were at? Do you all know what, first of all, do you know what economic and effort mobility means? It's your ability to expand and grow, isn't it? Yeah. They look at three primary things, and it's your ability to overall quality of life. They look at human, financial, and social capital. Those are the three primary areas that they look at. And they look at what people used to earn to what they earn now. Are people advancing in their careers as they get older in the state of Oklahoma? Or are they declining? And we actually are declining. And we are at the very, very bottom of the list. Matter of fact, there's only two below us. We're, number, we're, we're way down, way, way, way down low, let me tell you. Um, which tells us we're at the very, very bottom. Now, I joke all the time when I go into other states that I love being in Oklahoma because we're at the bottom of everything. And guess what? Whatever I do or anyone does, we only have one direction to go, right? I look at number nine, I think whatever we put in place, hopefully, if we do nothing, we can sustain it if we keep with what we're doing, but we only have one direction to go. 
Now, Norman, on the other hand, has the pressure, don't they, Bo? <laughs> it's not quite the same. As I said in one of the things that we did, as long as OU keeps winning, we'll be fine. <laughs> if the mind. sports ain't tough, yeah. well, you know, they're, they're having a good season, so <laughs> many, many things. So I think you're, that could explain some. Yeah. So keep the fans happy, right? Recruit certain individuals coming into the community. It helps. The peer report is one of many things that we start to look at. So when I see that we have a 4.2 unemployment rate, I have to look at that. Because when you're really in the trenches and you're looking at families, you realize families are hurting right now. So when they say 4.2 un um, unemployment rate and we're celebrating that, or even when I hear the president say we're, you know, we're doing better at 8 point whatever it is, uh, it saddens me. Because when I look at unemployment rate, I started to realize that for many of our families, they're unemployed, but they're working two jobs. And they can't find a full-time job with benefits anywhere. We've got all these places, even the movie theater, if you were to go to the movie theater right now, they're going to offer you health insurance. But you have to work 40 hours a week. And guess what? Guess how many are employed at 40 hours a week? One, the manager. Yeah. That's it. So for people who are trying to make a living, they're having to work two, three jobs and juggle that because they can't find a single solitary job. So yes, we can celebrate a 4.2 unemployment rate, but it's really a false illusion that that means that everything's healthy, that we're doing better than most people across the state, when the reality is we're still not healthy yet. We're still not doing what we're doing. We're still missing the mark there. Where are the jobs? How do we connect you all to those jobs to where you can go out, graduate in December, and have a job ready to up and go by January? And you almost have to be a go-getter. They're out there, but you've got to look for it, and you've got to sell yourself, and you've got to know what you're talking about. But what you're going to have to start to do from your point on the rest of your life is you're going to have to really analyze things. Is what I'm seeing an illusion, or is it really real? And when we say we're the ninth, I wonder where we rank in the U.S. Well, the Pew Report put us at the bottom three on economic and upward mobility. Tens of thousands, maybe, at the bottom of the list, probably. Yeah. And so although we're celebrating, we have a lot of work left to do. And that's part of what I challenge you guys when you go back into your communities. Our job is to make it better. We very much want to celebrate that we are ninth. I'm absolutely excited about that. I'm excited to hear Norman's up there. Some of these very communities I have lived in are, are, are there, which excites me beyond belief, because we want to make sure all of our communities are doing well. But we also want to make sure that we have a real picture. And that what we don't do is celebrate something and say, okay, job well done. If Norman goes, okay, we have number one ranking now, we can take it easy, what's going to happen? Think they'll be number one three years from now? Mm -mm. So everything's changing, too. Even if you did the same thing over and over again, you may run the risk of, I, I just read a positive affirmation, to be inconsistent. You need to be thoughtfully inconsistent, not to be stuck in doing the same old right. thing over and over again. You have to think about what's going on and how you respond. So when communities start, and I think you're absolutely correct, when communities start to look, and I look at Edmond, I look at Jinx and how it started to develop, I look at Fort Gibson outside of Muskogee. Uh, let's use this one. Let's go to Muskogee. I have a, a big heart for Muskogee. Um, spent a lot of time in Muskogee as well, by the way, and have a lot of family around that area. Fort Gibson, why did it start to grow out from Muskogee? You don't know? Well, this is something that I have to analyze. Uh, and we actually have building bridges there, by the way, in Muskogee. So it was our first one, their second one in the state of Oklahoma. So I will tell you the reason why Fort Gibson built out from Muskogee. As crime goes up, as poverty goes up, where do the dollars go? Well, we're not sticking around here if I don't feel safe, right? And why am I going to invest in this town anymore? Because I don't feel safe. And so often what happens is there's this flight that goes on that all of a sudden when poverty hits up to that 50% mark, you can expect those dollars to start leaving the community. Why Muskogee has such a high crime rate right now, they hit that mark, and it is almost impossible to turn it back around and save that community. And they're struggling every single solitary day, and they're having to think outside of the box, get out of the rut in order to save it. I look at Bartlesville, we're number nine. <clears throat> I look at Bartlesville, 
And in 15 years, where are we going to be at if we do not reverse? One out of two children are living in poverty now. One out of three senior citizens are living in poverty. We're at the 37% mark. We're getting closer and closer, and it's growing. We're not reversing it. So when poverty goes up, edu more and more people are dropping out and not achieving their educational goals as well, what all increases? Crime. What else? Suicide. Suicide. Mental, mental uh, illness. What they're not telling you in this report, <clears throat> we have, you know, they looked at quality of life, right? <clears throat> Washington County has one of the highest suicide rates nationally, not even in the state of Oklahoma. But yet we have one of the top 10 quality of life communities that we're living in. If we believe this, then we're going to say we don't have any problems and we don't need to address anything, right? Celebrate it, but we've got to have a realistic pulse on what we're doing. And that's part of what we have to start challenging our community is how to fix those things, how to look at that. Because what would depress me for Norman is as crime goes up and things go up in Norman, people start leaving and fleeing that. You know how Edmond came about in Oklahoma City? Exactly like Fort Gibson and Muskogee, Owasso to Tulsa. Jinx earlier in the years, in my younger years, to Tulsa. It grew out because crime went up, poverty went up, and they couldn't reverse it. There wasn't a clear, comprehensive plan to be able to address that. Next thing you know, big top people are moving their companies into a new location so their employees feel safer, so they can attract better quality employees to their company. There's reasons why things move, and we have to take that very seriously. Ponca City has gone through a lot. Is Ponca City up here anywhere? <clears throat> they had a large corporation in their community as well. And they're having to think outside the box and how they can save their community, how to entice people to come back into Ponca City, how to grow that community and stop the increase in, in poverty. They've got a huge challenge. Of the two, I think I'd rather be sitting in Bartlesville. Wouldn't you? Um, your role at UCO, how does that play a, an effective role in our economy? Why is it so important to have you all here in Bertlesville, Oklahoma? Why is it so important to me to have you all here? Did you say UCO? Or, no, Oklahoma Westlake. Thank you. Oh, did I say UCO? Yeah. yeah. Forgive me. You got me in Edmond. I'm past Edmond. I don't even care about that. I want to care right here. Why is it important to have OKWU right here? You absolutely do. How do you bring income to our community? Our farm workers. That's right. That's right. You know, I uh, tell people all the time that when I come here to you all and when I'm out there talking to big businesses and everything, that my number one thing is to keep every one of you right here in Burnsville, Oklahoma. It's very selfish. It's a hidden agenda of my own to tell you. I'm, I mean, I'm honest with it. I've told you that from day one since I met you. My job is to help you fall in love with Bartlesville and never ever leave Bartlesville. One day I'm hoping that you'll be telling your friend, I, Bartlesville, Oklahoma, we're number one. <laughs> and that's Teresa Wyatt, ah, Edmund, we don't have anything on you. That's my goal. But overall, I want this entire state to be healthy. Not because it embarrasses me when I go across the U.S. and they know we're at the very bottom of everything. That's not why. Because I want to live here and I want to retire here and I want to feel safe here. So we have to start to analyze that. You guys will be going back into communities when you graduate. You might not be staying in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, but you've got to decide how are you going to make your community better. Because here's what many people do not get, is that it takes absolutely every one of us in this community. And that's the thing so many people do not get that saddens me. So when crime goes up, that's not a good thing for me, is it? It's not a good thing for my children. It's not a good thing for me personally, but more importantly, it's not good for the individual who's committing the crime, is it? That's one more person we've lost that we've got to go back in and recruit, that we've got to go back in and save, that we've got to go back in and help. And that seems to be the missing piece of a lot of things. We just need to get tough on crime. We, we just need to get, get tough on crime. More laws, <laughs> put more people in prison, which in the United States is the highest per capita prison rate in mm -hmm. the world. Well, we imprison more people than yep. anyone else in the world. 
but like, highest even incarceration if you're in prison, too. Then, then that cost, that's another financial burden for the government. Not only that, you're writing those people off. Once you put them in that prison, they're not going, a vast majority of them will not be able to survive yeah, outside. Once you put them in the system, it's, yeah. it's no, it's well, they're labeled. Yeah. Even if they want to recover, we have them all the time at building yeah. bridges. They want to get jobs and they can't they get a can't job. They started implementing like a bonus for companies like my dad's to employ ex-cons. Like we get a tax bonus if we have them on our payroll. That's, that's, that's really progressive. Yeah, so that's a rarity. Like three out of our ten. I think Chick Fil A does that. Mm -hmm. They have a policy of firing people, giving them a second chance. And they're doing that down in I've Florida. heard that. I, don't, I know but that in Topeka, Kansas, it was true. But even then, like. What about those, like, would there be, like, rules of, like, if you get murdered, you got murdered? Because people also have professional bias, even though, like, they say we get hired, but they won't judge. Well, but then again, well, they've implemented programs, like, kind of more for the recovery. They're the ones who are putting up street signs and picking up all the debris and stuff. They're getting, like, the ability to try it off. Like, and then even if they have jobs, like, they're not, like, it's already hard for us to get a job. Things like people have fun. So my question to you is, our prison systems, are they set up to rehabilitate or are they set up to punish? I don't even think they punish them. I don't think they have that either. It's like a cage for, to try and control them and them, but there's no growth. There's no growth there, right? And so when they get out and they serve their time, what ultimately yeah. happens when they come back into a community that's ill-prepared to be able to help give them a second chance? If we're a very judgmental community, they go back. They go back. why do they go back? Do you think it's because they love prison? Kind of desperation. Desperation. Because they really have no choice. Yeah. I mean, if you sell if you sell drugs and you have a family and you convicted for that, and then like, uh, let's say you don't want to sell drugs, but you can't get a job, so you have to. I mean, you have to. You have to make tough decisions. Yeah. Exactly. Like an example of one, that's usually moonshiners. I don't know if y'all watched it, it, but um, one of the guys, I think, he, he went to jail and he has like four kids and he has to try to raise them and his wife. And so he said, well, I'm going to revert to moonshining. I know it's wrong, but I have to make a living. So he couldn't find a normal job. Yeah. For many people, that's exactly it. They can't find a job, even a minimum, minimum wage job in our community. It's very difficult to find one. I've had many people that have come out of prison that are doing fantastic, have ambitions and goals, and they're going to do things right this go around, only to be not to be able to feed themselves, to house themselves. They can't find housing anywhere. They can't find employment anywhere. And I'll never forget the day I had a phone call. I was working with one particular one for about six months, and I mean, I have, I was at my wit's end. I mean, I, I was trying to do about everything. I've never met someone who was so determined to do things different in his life. An intelligent, intelligent man. And he was just determined. And he calls me up just crying at night one night. And he said, you know what? My only option is either to go rob a convenience store at this point or kill myself. He had hit rock bottom. And it was at that moment that I started to realize we are failing in this community. This community that's ranked number nine for overall quality of life, yet I can tell you many people who do not feel like we deserve number nine, the overall quality of life. And I remember those faces. And that's when I started to challenge my board, sort of challenging our teams, our allies, our volunteers to a whole other level. Now, this individual is doing fantastic now. He did not go up any place, and he did not um, die by suicide. So I'm very, very happy with that. We were able to intervene pretty quickly um, and try new approaches, which then we just started representing him, going to businesses and saying, hey, he's a part of this initiative. This is where he's at right now. Are you willing to take a chance? And someone dared to take a chance. And he's doing fantastic now. Absolutely fantastic. But he was about to be a repeat offender or one of our high suicide rates again. And we had to intervene. So you're going to have some very things that you're going to be going back into your community and you're going to have to look at things. I mean, really look at things and challenge what you're seeing. Because when I first started seeing things, I thought we were doing great. I didn't worry about any of these things. Until you get into the trenches and you start to really meet people and you start to really find out what the problems are and where the challenges are, and then you realize sometimes the report that we're given is an illusion. Our job is to pull that apart. So when someone tells me a 4.2% unemployment rate, I'm going to celebrate that's great, but I want to know how did you go about calculating that? Where's the, where's the data? How did, they, how did they get the data? Yeah. Where does it come from? 
that's what you guys are here for, is that to get the education to understand all that, not just be an ignorant public that just receives whatever's being said on the media, because that's just a media release. I don't know that that real estate, maybe they're trying to sell real estate. Could be. It could be another medical I'm sure company. they're trying to sell real estate. It's a real estate company that's backed that up, or a, that's some kind of association. So if you go in and you look and you see you know, if those who declared unemployment and you look at those who dropped off because they're no longer eligible, is that because they're employed now or is that because they no longer are eligible for unemployment? So where did that statistic come from? Or did they give up? Yeah. Also, Quit well, looking for a job and now they're not signed up for it. Exactly. And right. many have done that as well. One of the things is unemployment and then you know that people just drop off of the like search for a job, they call themselves. That's what, I don't know what they call it, that's what we were talking about, mm -hmm. is that after a while people will just give up and um, I'm not sure what, they're all the things they, they do. And then they can't qualify for unemployment because they're not searching. Mm -hmm. Correct. On the past, but they're called um, displaced workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They miss it. And you guys know, like, my, they've heard, they get, I get on a soapbox about the educational system. One of the things about having Oakwood here is that this is an alternative educational system. Um, theoretically, it's different. Maybe not as different as it needs to be, but my goal in life is to, t to try to expose you guys to enough stuff that you would not settle for the kind of public education that you may receive or your kids will receive and your grandkids are like, I'm really hurt, worried about my grandson. And it's not that there's evil people in the system, there's really good people that are sincerely, but they're sincerely deluded if they think that what we've been doing the last hundred years is working. It's not working, it doesn't work, it didn't work then, it doesn't work now, you can't reform it. Just an example is standardized testing. Standard, I was thinking about in terms of the prison idea. Standardized testing is essentially creating colonization of the brain. That if you don't pass this test, then you fit into this category. If you don't pass this test, you fit into this category. Once you're labeled under that category, you're labeled for the rest of your life. That's a permanent record. So we have people that are already in prison and aren't in prison because they don't believe that they're worthy of what people up here can do. So they don't deserve college because they're not smart enough to take tests. Now I want to, some of you in here are really good at taking tests, but I'm going to insult you right now because it may be akin to being a good circus performer. You know how to do the acrobatics of taking tests. It doesn't mean you know anything. It, it's, Education is completely separate from that, and they started the standardized testing. There is a per there was a reason for doing it, and it was more or less about the industrial revolution. And some of the people that found that all the good charities now, those good old people, Carnegie and Rockefellers, and all those got together and decided they needed people that would sit still and put parts in place and wouldn't complain and wouldn't have creative thinking and wouldn't think outside the box. Because if they get outside the box, you're not going to show up for work one day. Quite frankly, who's going to put up with it? And and I know I sound like a conspiracy nut. I can lead you to all the evidence for this. It's very, it's not that easy to find, except some people found it for us. But the point is that I think the educational system is another form of prison. And it's a, and it's not that the people that are doing it now know what they're doing. I'll give you one example. I may have said this before. My kindergarten's grandson comes to town, and. Uh, and it's, this sounds silly to you probably, but he showed up early because he rides the bus from Circle Mountain and we're way out there, so he rides the bus early. They wouldn't let him in the building. He had to stand outside because they, they have a rule that you stand outside if you show up early, unless you have a lunch program. So I walked up there one day. He kept taught, telling us this, and I thought this can't be. Well, I walked up there. It was about 15 degrees. And here's my grandson standing out by this, the lady at the front, guarding the door, so you can't get in or out. Well, you can only get in if you have the right password, essentially. Yeah. And when I, I told her she, he rides a Circle Mountain bus, she says, oh, no one told me that. No one asked either. And he didn't know what to tell them. So there's or even this, if that was irrelevant. Yeah. That there's a third. It's cold outside. Yeah, and he was in a coat. He wasn't going to die. But the idea that you would hold a child outside and I know it's because of staffing and all that, but you know what? They had an entryway right inside the door, and when we complained about it, the next day, the principal uh, had had the kids come inside to that area that didn't have a meal plan. 
because they don't want kids running around all in the school that don't aren't there for. Right. I understand that, but it's it's like you have these categories that you set up for people, and if you don't fit in the category, you're standing outside. It was and, a perfect metaphor. And the metaphor. teacher who's there can only feel like they can only implement one rule. Right. It's black or white. She couldn't do anything yeah. else because nobody told her to do yeah. anything else. She or couldn't think it. outside the box. Yeah. And we can can condition ourselves. You all, I will tell you, I've raised um, children in a pro in a private school system, and I've raised children in the public school system. And I'm going to tell you, both are equally successful, and it's really due to parenting. It's not really due to the educational system. I do believe it's in a compare. It's in conjunction with. I always work with the teachers, but I challenge results there too. And that's one of the things that you will have to do as a parent. It's one of the things you will have to do in your community. When I see the no child left behind and some of the standardized and where Bartlesville ranks and all of that, then I want to know. Okay, what is? What do you mean by ninety some odd percent passed? Right. Passed so what? What? What's the level passed? And you find out it's fifty seven point nine percent. So let me get this straight. As long as mine makes a D or above, <laughs> they're considering passing. I don't know about you, it's but my high standards were behind. It's a high D. Yes. <laughs> my son was told that in high yeah. school. Yeah. And he sincerely looked at me and said, it's a high D, Dad. Yeah. And I started laughing. <laughs> it's true. It's and true. I started laughing. And, he, and he, he was hurt. He's, yeah. He was hurt. Because yeah. he really thought they were trying to give him a compliment. And I, I suppose they were. Yeah. But this is a kid that now think me circles around me, but he couldn't fit in their system. Well, and one of the things that I absolutely love about you all being here in Oklahoma Wesleyan University as well too, is they're very dedicated to the community outreach piece of this. They're very dedicated in making sure that we have the right workforce entering um, not only the needs of our community, but also the needs of other communities as well, and across the U.S. And so that's one of the things that I'm very, very appreciative of. That is one of the reasons why Bartlesville is where they're at. And I will tell you, Edmond, and Norman are up there because of the universities that are sitting in their, their hometowns as well. And so that plays a big role in that, and I'm very appreciative of that, and I'm very appreciative of all the efforts. And it's one of the things why I spend time here, why I spend time with you all, is because I look at my future workforce and I think, guess where I need to employ them from? Right here. I look at people that are going to be changing policy in our community, that will be leaders in our community, and they're right here. I too sat in a room just like you at your age. Never thought I would ever make policy change. Never dreamed about being working on the national level or doing anything really significant. I was just counting down the semesters I had remaining <laughs> and the hours I had left. And part of the fear on graduation, we were talking about this earlier, part of the fear of graduation is you have about a thousand different emotions coming at you all at once. You're exhausted, but you're very excited about the future. You feel proud of what you accomplished, but very fearful about what in the world's next. What do I do now? I feel excited and I feel sad because the only thing I've ever known is my educational career. That's all I've ever done all my life and now I'm going to be doing something different. But when you can leave with a plan that your education never ends, and I will tell you mine has never ended. I am I'm still here, what, today, on campus at a university, <laughs> even today. It never stops. But when you start to connect that you're going to be going into whatever community where you have a job at, and your job is to leave it a little bit better. So what are you going to do to make it a little bit better? And you're going to have to start seeing these things that are given to you, and you see in the newspaper all the time, and your job is to really analyze it. In the world of Google, which we did not have in my time, we didn't have the internet, when I was in high school, we didn't have, matter of fact, our first word processor came out during my freshman year, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever, absolutely ever. But then I was in the typewriter, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever, because I could back up and you'd erase it without having to white out. I thought that was the coolest thing ever, too. So we've come a long ways in my lifetime alone. But you're going to have to really challenge. I wish I would have had Google back then. I wish I would have been able to look at what is the minimized standardized testing score, and should we really be celebrating this or not? What is an amenity? Yeah, what is an amenity? <laughs> exactly. You have wealth of knowledge. You have 15 different fingertips. definitions. That's what you have to sort out. Yeah. Because you've got all the information, but how do you, what's the useful information? Yeah. You know, you can have an, a, a definition that's not useful. So if you saw the newspaper last week, and if you have to get Tulsa World, I do. If you saw the Tulsa World newspaper last week, it said Oklahoma, one of the ninth most miserable states to live in. 
you know, there's headings that make me real proud. <laughs> and I had some friends call from Fort Collins and said, I heard the Gallup report came out. Oklahoma's like number nine as far as the most miserable states to live in. And uh, they're from Fort Collins, which, by the way, is ranked number yeah. one best place to live in yeah. in the nation. Uh, for, and I've been there often, and I can see why they're Probably ranked that. It's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. However, that is our reality. So when we start to see these type of things, we have to put in a comparison of what are we ranked statewide, what does that really mean across the U.S., and are we really holding the bar? So we celebrate. I want you to definitely brag to your Edmund friend that it's worth celebrating and saying we outranked you. But you as a person have a responsibility to make this town better. Guess where you live right now? In the ninth? <laughs> right here. We're competing with Owasa right now. So what you do when you come into even my program and to other programs, Wars of the Martyrs, other places you're doing internships, make all the difference in the world. And you have a brief moment to change history in someone's life. And you never know what you're saying or doing, or just the fact that you're acting interested all of a sudden, can make all the difference in the life. You all coming in spurs them up to all of a sudden want to go back to college. Dare to dream. How are you doing it? If you can do it, I can do it. You talking about that with them, and all of a sudden they started to realize this might be a possibility. We went from having zero in universities to having 49% of our participants in either a four-year degree program or a Tri-County tri Technology Center. That's significant. That's never been done. Not in my 20 years of trying to move the needle in it. And it came about because you know why? They're hanging out with you all. All of a sudden, I see statistics changing for the first time ever whenever we partnered with Oklahoma Wesleyan University and you all started coming in because now they're talking about things that they've never talked about before. Now they're seeing people who are actually getting their degree, which they've never seen before. When you live in a very sheltered world and you don't see the other side, how can you dream it? If I've never known anyone who's ever gotten their degree, how are they ever going to get their degree? How many of you have ever been the first to get your degree in your family? Now, I will tell you, that was challenging. It's very challenging. Was there anyone there to help you with the FAFSA? No, and I'm paying completely on my own. Yeah. Um, it's a school of hard knocks, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked three jobs. Three jobs, if you can imagine, putting myself through. And then I took care of a 16-year-old sister who moved in with when my parents left clear across the U.S. Very, very difficult. The odds were against me. Do you know why I'm here today? Why I succeeded? Take a guess. Community. Hmm? Community. Yeah. Community. Yeah. I had a professor, Dr. Story was his name, I'll never forget it, who believed in me. I was just about to quit. I was just about to drop out. Especially when my 16-year-old my sister showed up and I now not only had myself to take care of, but I had her to take care of as well. He wrapped people around me, and I got through it because of the support that he put into place. Do you know why I believe in social capital to this day? It's because it's what saved me. And if I can overcome it and do it, and not be living homeless, and overcome the odds, my sister to this day travels all over the world. 16-year-old came to me pregnant, and today, She's high up in a Fortune 500 company, travels all over the world, just got back in from India over the weekend, is doing fantastic. Came out the other side. But it was because we worked together. I allowed people to help me. I allowed that positiveness to come around me. And that right there is truly the answer. Someone dared to make sure I wasn't a statistic. I wasn't going to be doing crime. I wasn't going to be dealing drugs. I wasn't going to do prostitution. I was going to have a strong belief in God. They were going to make sure that someone was going to save me and someone cared enough about me to save me. You know what my job is now? Save others. I take it very, very, very serious. And so I encourage you guys, really start to analyze. When you start to see things, challenge this kind of statistics. Celebrate it. I'm still incredibly happy we're number nine. Don't get me wrong. I'm incredibly happy. But when I'm out talking with Rotary and they're telling us we don't really have a problem, our overall quality of life is right here, I'm going to have to give them a hardcore reality that you're only looking at one thing. We want to believe the positive. We really don't want to believe that these other things are going on. And the reality is if we don't see it, 
and we don't act on it and we don't develop plans, we will no longer be the ninth. We will go downhill fast. Bethany, you caught a Mustang, by the way. You caught a Mustang does not surprise me at all. They too had some comprehensive uh, help. Some people also filtered some major money in there. Do you all know who filtered some major money in there? Garth <clears throat> Brooks was one of those people. Who? Hey, Garth Brooks. Oh, Garth Brooks? Oh, I love it. I love it. No, he hasn't been around for a while. So yes. I love it. Um, a real famous country singer who also did some songs in rock and roll. He took a, a disguise. You remember his name? That AKA, he was some other person for a while, and you almost didn't recognize him. He had black hair, looked very gothic. He was trying to make it into rock and roll, and he wanted to see if he could do it again. You know, if he came out as Garth Brooks, that, you know, and actually sell, but he wanted to see if he could do it as a disguised person. It was very funny. Uh, but Garth Brooks, you know where he lives now? Owasa. Owasa. Right here. He's just down the road from us. Wait, Absolutely. Garth he's Brooks? A, he's a Country? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably, I think I might even have a picture of a red to okay. Target one day. Okay. Yeah, you, you need to Google it. You just Google it. Google yeah. Garth Brooks. Yeah. He's fantastic. He is fantastic. Yeah. He's a very famous country singer, but he also, um, he'll go back on tour. His great, great, great grandchildren will not have to financially ever worry. That's how much, and he's right up there with a lot of uh, extreme, extreme wealth. He is right up there. And he lives very modestly in Owasso, Oklahoma, has given a lot to Yukon in that area to help them thrive through a hospital and through some other donations as well. So he's a strong philanthropist giving back in his community. You too have to give back. We all have to be philanthropists, and that's one of the things that I encourage you. Mark Lautman, what do you all think about his book so far? Yeah, yeah. He was an economic developer, and his story in itself is pretty amazing um, when you hear some, some past stories of his life. But he really summed it up. Have you all got to the winning and losing communities yet? Yes. Have you done it? What, what was your thoughts there? We've only half, half the class we've done so far. So. For those of you who have done it, what do you think?